So we talked about uh, just kind of using this last little bit of time to reflect together on coming together. I, I actually thought this had occurred before. So the first question I'd ask Julie is, uh, how often have you done this? This is the first time we've ever done it. So obviously, the first question to be thinking about, is this really a useful uh, uh, gathering? Is this allowing something to happen that would not have happened otherwise? In what way is this a, a useful element of, of the process? I think Julie tried to give a bit of an overview at the beginning today of the processes that are in place now, the school, some of the structures that have come into play at the Institute, just reading the last year or two. Some of them are quite new, to my knowledge. Um, so, uh, but the really point, key point here is you guys do the work. So you're the ones who've been here all day, but not just here all day. You're deeply immersed in doing the different facets of this. Um, as I've uh, gotten to know Julie and talked to her about this particular day, there's like two ideas that have come back again and again and again. One is uh, the title of the day. You know, how does MIT become a game changer? And the second is, how do we do it together? How do we build a different sense of community, connection, working together? Uh, it's very easy, and it's very natural in not just MIT, but any academic environment, that quickly everybody goes off into their respective lab or classroom and does all sorts of wonderful things, but there's no real sense of, of doing it together. And consequently, a lot of lost synergies, opportunities, and maybe even completely lost ideas that could be key for being a game changer. So I just want to kind of open it up a little bit and see anybody have any reflections from the day as those of you, again, doing the work, as you sat here and listened in either of those two areas or in best yet, combining the two, what, what really stands out for you is the opportunities for M MIT as a game changer and doing it more together. Um, I think that uh, w one of the things, I, I'm Jeremy Gregory, I'm in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and the Executive Director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub. And in some of the work that we do, what we found is that, you know, trying to tackle a particular topic uh, and then asking people basically, you know, what would you do to solve this problem? Rather than being prescriptive about the, the solutions, just saying, this is what we're trying to do. And then what MIT does best is innovate then. And uh, some of the earlier discussions we had actually was about for, uh, for some ideas basically opening it up to this, this hackathon was the, uh, the, the uh, idea that we came up with earlier. But I think that's, that's the kind of thing where MIT excels, you know, not being prescriptive about solutions, just saying this is the problem, how do we innovate and get the people together uh, and motivate them to actually try and, try and solve it. One of the things that I thought uh, was compelling about today's discussion. I think she's already gone. The student that was in our group this morning r really thought that changing behavior was important. It's not just about what we build and how we build it. It's about how people operate the spaces that they're in. So uh, teaching people at a younger, uh, a younger age, for example, she was talking about uh, having it be a core requirement class for students coming in. Uh, really helps develop new behaviors so that somebody who's so focused on the work that they're doing isn't so focused that they're not thinking about, oh, I don't have to have three sashes of fume hoods open or I could have turned the lights off in that office when I walked out or something like that. And so it's a little bit about changing behavior and, and I thought that was a, a good point that she made this morning. One thing that really struck me in the conversations, especially this morning, was everyone's willingness and interest in having a more transparent and collaborative working environment. I was really surprised by that. Um, it's something that I work on every day, and I know of another, uh, some other initiatives in MIT that are doing that. But to hear three different groups in the working groups this morning say that that's what they wanted. They wanted hackathons, they want innovation, but they want it to be open for everyone to participate. That was really surprising and inspiring for me, especially because in traditional academia, it's very compelling to keep things really closed and to succeed in our own projects and not necessarily work across borders, but that's what we're all interested in doing. One of the things that I think is um, uh, extraordinary about MIT is the way that we can cut across diversity of schools and diversity of stakeholders. And I think that we've had great representation here today of a real diversity of staff. We've had faculty here, we've had students here. We've mentioned alumni. Um, I would love to see us be able to have um, a more robust engagement across those four um, 
constituencies of the MIT campus because they are all invested and implicated and um, important for our success in moving forward. So I think that it, as we're reflecting on today as a opportunity to connect on sustainability, I think that we've got some, some real successes there and I think we also have room to grow. So today's was a lot of preaching to the choir because we are the choir. A lot of us are invested either in what we do or what we study or what, or what we teach. Uh, in terms of some aspect of, of sustainability or another, but we've never gotten all together. And so the choir needs the same sheet of music to use. And so today went a long way toward all of us having a common understanding of what sustainability means to MIT. And I think as we leave here, um, we need to use that sheet of music that we've all worked on today. So. Like I said, forgive the amount of metaphors I'm using. You know, we do have a lot of things going on that are similar to sustainability in that we're trying to study them from a lot of different angles. It's only a, a piece of a lot of people's jobs, and then there are a few people for whom it's their entire job. Um, and so I'm thinking about wellness as something going on on campus, and I see Howard over there, and I'm not sure who else might be here, but you know, when I think about what we're trying to do for um, our community in terms of wellness, I think there, there may be some synergies there. Um, and sustainability, of course, could fall into that category. And I think there may be other things as well, if we think about them, where um, perhaps Ed Birchinger's work um, in terms of community development, equity and community development. So I think we, we ought to think about where there are connections between things that cut across the entire campus and how, um, how as a community, we need to approach those. I'm struck from the day's sessions about the <clears throat> number of times and the frequency of people's desire for better, for data and better data to educate, to, to make decisions, to learn, um, but this dichotomy about the competency that we individually or as a, as a group may have in collecting, understanding, deciding, and using that data in a way that is knowledgeable. And I think there is this, this chasm between our need for better understanding of the decisions that we need to make and our lack of, of competency or, or um, understanding of the best ways to take advantage of that. If I can just add one thought on that, we, we have to be careful that this doesn't become another technical fix. Because uh, certainly one of the themes I've heard a lot is recognizing that there's an immense array of, of complex technical issues, but that uh, game changing isn't about those only. It includes those, but it's really about how an institution moves. Um, I just want to add one additional thought, something else I picked up from Julie, who uh, I've talked with on numerous occasions, not just for, for this. Um, and, and it relates to what you were saying about, I mean, I'm always sensitive to words. The word sustainability, which 25 years ago was really not in use at all, suddenly is now used everywhere, and it means a million different things. Um, and, and I think that if, if you're doing something that's really important, you have to be able to use different types of words. Um, Julie said something which I thought was a slightly different frame, but very interesting for all of us to ponder. She said, for me, this whole effort is about capacity building. She said something to this effect just a little while ago, too. Building the capacity of an institution to deal with truly complex issues. So that's a little different way to frame it. Obviously, there are kind of no more iconic complex issues in our world today than poverty, destruction of ecosystems, climate destabilization, and this, the kind of issues that would mostly get under that umbrella of sustainability. But uh, I think that, as you were saying, why, what's wrong with also seeing wellness and the health and well-being of the community at a place like MIT as part of what we're focused on? I think you're absolutely right. And if you think about it the way Julie said it, building the capacity of an institution to deal with truly complex issues, the sort that fall between the cracks or people work on and work on and work on and never really make much headway is a wonderful uh, kind of overall frame for me. Um, and one last thing I just thought I'd like to share because I've heard it expressed in a couple different ways. Um, I'm, unlike you, I spend most of my time at other places, not 
doing the kind of work you guys do here at MIT, but it's the same kind of work. And I've watched many organizations on their journeys, you know, first to get some traction. I mean, these issues are so big, it's easy for people to go, oh, it's impossible. And, you know, invariably they start with energy efficiency, waste reduction, stuff that they can measure and make a business case for. It's very understandable. You've got to take a first step. And for most institutions, those are the kind of first steps. Um, but relatively large percentage kind of gets stuck there. <laughs> you know, they never get much beyond, you know, the proverbial metaphor we always use in the organization you know, change field was the low-hanging fruit. The things for which you, if you just get your act together, by golly, you can do a lot. And again, they're compelling and they're measurable and you have a pretty direct to the bottom line impact. Um, my primary conclusion from watching many, many institutions, mostly in the business sector, get beyond being stuck with the relatively easy things, is it eventually becomes part of their DNA. They find a way to connect, and it's different for everyone, because you might say the institutional DNA, the kind of core cultural DNA of every institution is unique, as it is for every person. Um, and so to me, the big question here on being a game changer and doing it together kind of loops back to I like the way it was phrased earlier. What's unique to MIT? I appreciated the, the rebut. Well, let's not get so caught up in being unique. That's fair enough. But if you think about what is it that really defines who we are that would naturally generate energy, would naturally foster more and more integration, more and more internalization, more and more real scale. Um, and uh, if you're an institution like MIT, that would always start with a very simple point, you know? How does this core, how is this, however we define this, core to our educational mission? How is it core to our research mission? And I think for MIT, it has to be both. Because this is not just an educational institution. And the synergy between what we do as researchers and what we do as teachers is really right at the core, to me, of what makes MIT really a great institution. It's not unique. Many institutions could claim that. But then when you dig into that, you find a lot of pretty unique or idiosyncratic features. So how does it affect the students? And how does it allow us to kind of bring our research? I was playing with all kinds of funny images in my head. We, we got all sorts, always, always have great people doing research individually. But if we keep that idea of collectively, you might say, well, wouldn't it be cool if anybody doing anything that was pertinent to any of these issues in any of their research processes had a way of making that visible to the community as a whole? So people could say, oh, well, we could use that, or we could use that over here, or that person has done a lot of similar work. Why don't we go and talk to them about what we're trying to do? So how to make the research accessible? That's a question that, in many ways, of course, many of us deal with all the time in our increasingly interconnected, you know, web-enabled world. But I just wouldn't lose sight of the impact on the students, too. Because, uh, I, for me, one of the criteria would be don't do anything that doesn't involve students in some meaningful way. And there's where I think one of the idiosyncratic features of MIT would naturally come into play. And I'm just saying something that I've heard several people say, the hands-on nature of education. I've always thought that the labs were the kind of the, the archetype of what MIT is all about. Because the labs were not just about, uh, where the research was done, the lab was where the uniqueness of the MIT education experience occurred. So don't do anything that doesn't involve the students. Think about how it connects to the research and educational mission. Thank you so much, Peter.